Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. We are so happy to have everyone here this morning at Canopy's first webinar of 2021. I am Griffin O'Shaughnessy, Canopy's founder and CEO, but I like to call myself our director of discovery. Thanks to Sarah Beth Burke. More on that later in the webinar. Canopy's mission is to inspire extraordinary talent to connect with meaningful work. We simplify connecting organizations with top level professional talent by being at the nexus of talent curation, a business marketplace, and a solution matchmaker. We are so delighted to have Sarah Beth Burke with us here this morning, one of Canopy's strategy consultants leading us through this interactive session. Sarah Beth is a creative disruptor who demystifies human experiences in complex situations. Her expertise is in investigating why people do what they do. She designs incentives and systems that produce gains, not pain. She works at the intersection of design, strategy, and systems thinking. Colleagues see Sarah Beth as the person who challenges limiting beliefs tests assumptions and drives ideas into action by building strong relationships. Her identities of artist, researcher, educator, and designer enable her to translate concepts between creative and analytical spaces and make cross-disciplinary connections. As a researcher, Sarah Best studies and speaks about hybrid professionals people with multiple professional identities who integrate their talents together and bring unique values to employers and clients. Sarah Beth is a doctor of philosophy and earned her PhD from the University of Denver in curriculum and instruction. Before starting her company, More Than My Title, Sarah Beth led innovation work for Denver Public Schools. She was also the founding director of CU's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative. So welcome, Sarah Beth. We are so thrilled to have you present to Canopy's community this morning, and we can't wait to dig in with you about our own hybrid identities. We would love for this to be an interactive session, so please feel free to ask questions live or use the chat feature to ask a question anytime, and I will be monitoring that and bringing those questions to Sarah Beth's attention. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Sarah Beth. Thanks for being here this morning. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Griffin. I think we want to take a little group snapshot. Am I right? So That would yeah. be great. Yeah. Okay, everyone smile and look like you're awake for this morning. Yay, <laughs> we'll get that Sarah. going. Okay. Three, two, one. Do we have it? Got it. Awesome. <laughs> Um, it's really a delight to be here. I know a lot of you are fans of Canopy, you work with Canopy, you're leading amazing organizations, and this topic might be somewhat new to you, a little obscure, but I promise you um, this is the future and the present. So I have a lot to share and I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get going. Here we go. Okay, and as Griffin mentioned, this is going to be interactive, not just you asking questions in the chat, but there's a couple worksheets. I have an activity towards the end of this I'll talk about in a moment. So if you received your email confirmation, just check that because um, there were some attachments for worksheets. And if you don't have those, no problem. Some paper and pen will be fine for you today. So we're gonna talk about the hybrid professional. And a hint is this is who you are at the intersections of your work identities. So the reason we're here, I wanna start with three core ideas that are really driving the topic of today. First is this quote, the average adult worker holds more than 10 jobs in a lifetime and reinvents their career three to four times. Maybe that sounds like you, but what that's really implying is that people are changing jobs a lot and there's a reason for that. Also, I think workers feel like this. Many people have you know, this urge to multitask and do a lot of things. Professionals I interview tell me they wear a lot of hats, they're a jack of all trades. And that's because they're doing a lot of things, but they're also really talented at many things. And so there's something going on here with our workforce. And the other part of today 
is this. These are headlines from the media and news, and I collected these over the last six months. That's how recent they are. And what you'll notice in all of these is the term hybrid, hybrid work, hybrid learning, hybrid workforce, and this idea of a choir, the finding a way to sing, just ignore the steering wheel, implying that our events and cultural opportunities and so many experiences today are becoming hybridized. We are all experiencing this. So what does this mean? What are we looking at? Well, for the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm gonna give you some background on myself and this research I've been doing on hybridity because it's been a core passion of mine for a while now. I'll give you an overview of what's going on with hybridity and how it connects with work. Then I'll talk about examples of hybrids so you can really see this in action. We'll do some short activities so you can apply this to yourself. And then of course, we'll have more open Q&A at the end. What I want you to walk away with today are these key ideas. Understanding the difference between hybrid professionals and other types of workers, because a lot of people are not hybrids. Not everyone has to be one, but I want you to understand the difference. Why hybrids are critical to the workforce and what to consider when hiring them. I think it's important to see how you might have a hybrid identity, but also if you're working in an organization, then this is going to matter for your future talent recruitment too. You'll also get tools to explore the intersections of your professional identities and finally, some tips on how to rethink a better title for yourself that conveys your unique value as a hybrid. What do you do? This is the ultimate question, right? I'm sure you ask people this a few times a week or you get asked this question often. And I wonder about this question a lot. It's honestly what drives my research because the what do you do question unlocks who are you? How are you perceived in the world? So let's take a quick poll, and I want to hear how all of you feel about this question, what do you do? Is it easy for you to answer? No problem. You've got that set. Is it one of those questions that you're like, oh, I don't know. I change it every time someone asks me. This is really an, a key thing to reflect on because it unlocks this whole question of what do you do in your work and who are you? So we're getting the poll results in, and it looks like majority of people over half are changing depending on who they're talking to. Um, and the other buckets, the I cringe because it's hard to describe and the great I have no problems are almost equal. I personally have fallen into the bucket of I cringe. This has always been a question that um, trips me up because I didn't know how to express my identity accurately and authentically until I realized I could use this idea of being a hybrid. So thanks for those responses. I'm gonna share the results to you and we're gonna keep going. So who am I? I am Sarah Beth Burke. And I used to introduce myself as, hi, I'm the director of program X, whatever I was doing at that time. But that's a pretty generic way of expressing who I am. And it would take a lot of additional explanation for people to see, you know, what was I really doing? And here's how I felt in my work. I was making art as an artist and showing it in galleries and selling it, but I was also teaching in the classroom. I was an art teacher back in the start of my career. I led graphic facilitation and did graphic design. I was presenting and facilitating. This is how my professional identity felt to me. I had all of these different areas of expertise, but people only saw me as one thing at a time and they compartmentalized me. Oh, you're Sarah Beth, you're the teacher. And so this was tricky for me when I was shifting jobs and trying to grow in my leadership because I knew I had so much to offer, but how do I get people to understand what all of these different identities have to do with one another? This literally kicked off a professional identity crisis, which led to making this my dissertation research. And it wasn't until I looked at all the data I had collected and I happened to stumble upon this painting by Rene Magritte and what you see behind me in this image is a fish combined with a human. And typically we call that a mermaid. We have a name for it, but that's not what Magritte did. He reversed it. And when I saw this painting, I went, oh my gosh, this is how I feel in my professional identity. I'm a combination of things that I have no name for. I'm a whole new type of professional. Whoa, is that possible? Like, how do, I, how do I describe this? And that was really the start of understanding hybrid identity is what really resonates with me. So today, 
I call myself a creative disruptor. That's my hybrid title I've given to name myself. And being a creative disruptor encompasses having an artist, researcher, edu educator, and designer identity. When those four identities that are my truest, best talents, when they're combined, I am creatively disrupting and seeing things and actively creating these innovation strategies that are supporting people and resources in new ways. I really wanted to share this message in a bigger way. And so as I've been interviewing professionals, I wrote a book about this and it came out in April. It's called More Than My Title, The Power of Hybrid Professionals in a Workforce of Experts and Generalists. In addition to the book, I created a workbook because as you can see, understanding the concept is important, but how do you take this into practice is also a question people needed to answer. So I created a whole series of activities and that's what the workbook shares. And I'll be doing two of those with you in a little bit. So to give more background on this, I wanna start from the lens of identity because identity is what we're really talking about. Identity is every part of what makes you you, race, class, gender, age, ethnicity, education. We have so many different dimensions of our identity, but I think one dimension we don't talk about enough really is our occupational identity or professional identity. That on its own is a very complex type of identity. So when we talk for the rest of this session and you think about all the things you do and identities you have, just focus solely on the dimension of profession and what you do in your work. I define professional identity as anything you do you consider to be work, whether or not you get paid. If you're volunteering or serving on a board or have an internship, that could be your work. But if you have hobbies and other interests like gardening and cooking and you know, doing soccer and mountain biking, those don't have to do with your work. So what's really fascinating here is I just dig into one dimension and then explore all the different parts within professional identity. Here's my framework that I use to express what I'm noticing in the workforce. There are three types of professionals. And the first type is singularity. That means that someone only really has one professional identity and we refer to those people as experts and specialists. The second type of, of professional identity is multiplicity. We reference this by calling people gig workers, polymaths, renaissance souls, jacks of all trades. You've probably heard that a lot. And then there's sort of this missing piece because if you're not just multiplicity or singularity, you kind of are somewhere in between. We haven't had a way to reference that. And that's hybridity. Hybrid, hybridity is where a professional is integrating their different professional identities and working at the intersections. That integration instead of separation is really critical to understand in this because people that have a lot of identities may not be connecting and crossing them together. That's the difference between a hybrid and someone who isn't. I use an analogy of a pizza because a pizza is made up of a lot of parts and ingredients and we don't eat a pizza as one ingredient at a time. We eat it as this delicious, melty, you know, full of flavor thing because all those ingredients together make it as delicious as it is. And that's what hybrids are. They're taking all of this tapestry of their work identity and weaving it together to be something bigger. And we don't have great names for what to call them. And I love this quote because this really emphasizes the hybrid nature where it's not about the things, but the relationship between them. When you can explain the relationship between, in my case, being an artist and an educator, a designer and a researcher, that's when people start to understand my unique value. Another way to think about this is through the two products of a Swiss army knife and a camelback. So both of them have different parts. A Swiss army knife though, you only use one part at a time, right? The camelback is a water bottle backpack combination. They're totally integrated and embedded together. You can't separate it. And it wouldn't be the product if it was those two different parts. So a hybrid product is like a camelback. And that's what we're talking about in work and identity. I also think it's important to mention, usually when we think about work, there's this old mindset that work is about finding your passion, what you're good at and share that with the world and somewhere in between is what you should do for a job. And that's true, but it's missing something. 
I tend to think about work like this. Work is more of a three-legged stool where you need to know what you love, which is your passion and your purpose while you do what you do. But who are you when you're following your passion and purpose? What do you call yourself? Using terms like I'm a manager, I'm a director, I'm a CEO, I'm a leadership coach. Is that truly your professional identity? Do those really accurately describe what you really do at your intersections? So now let's talk about hybridity and work and tying it also back to your organization because I think that element is important of how you apply it to what you're doing. I'm wondering if you've thought about how the difference between these three items, which are hybrid workplaces, hybrid work and roles, you could also call that hybrid jobs, and hybrid workers. So we're gonna take a little poll on this one too. Let me know where you stand on those three different areas. Okay, here we go. Poll is up. So how comfortable are you or, or your organization with hybrid workplaces, jobs, and people? Oh, this is getting good. People are thinking about it. Choices are, it's going great, we've got this. Second one is, we're okay, but we're learning. The other one is, we're struggling to make sense of this. And the last one is, there's hybrid people too? And as the results are coming in, looks like people are pretty heavy in the direction of we're okay, but we're learning and adapting. And then kind of split evenly between the other buckets. And I'm gonna end the poll so we can move forward. Okay. And I'll share those results with you. So a lot of people are adapting and learning. Thanks for that. So quickly, I'm gonna go through each three. Hybrid workplaces is the easiest one. This is where work, the, the environment is hybrid, right? It's the physical office space with virtual remote kind of work. And that's what a lot of us are doing right now. Some people are in the office and others aren't. So then let's talk about hybrid work itself and the roles and jobs that you might have. This is where work becomes hybrid. It's cross-disciplinary. It's combining rare combinations of skills, that multidisciplinary idea, even looking at opposite qualities like being really analytical and creative. Evidence of where this is happening is in positions like engineering. 57% of engineering positions now require business and leadership skills. More than half of all IT jobs now require some form of digital design. And marketing managers who know SQL make 41% more than those who don't. So that's how this idea of hybrid work is really starting to happen more and more by combining almost opposite or you know, really divergent skill sets. According to Burning Glass, they did a hybrid jobs report in 2019. They say that a hybrid role means reinventing existing roles and forging the creation of new ones. So if you are looking to hire or create a new job in your organization, is it a hybrid job when you are thinking about that? You know, Look at what roles and what skills you're really trying to reach and achieve in that new position. I'm gonna show a couple of job postings that I've seen in the last few months. This one is by Jump, which is a design agency in California. They were hiring an innovation strategist. And I love right away out of the gate, they say, are you a hybrid thinker? So they're using the language of being a hybrid in the job posting. And they say they're looking for hybrid thinkers out there, people that are one part humanist, one part technologist, one part capitalist. And if you read further down, they say someone with an MBA and a degree in anthropology, a filmmaker and an entrepreneur, they really knocked this out of the park by showing the diversity of talents and identities they're looking in one person. This is an extreme example, but it's a real one because I want you to realize this is happening out there in the workforce and companies realize hybrid talent is something they need. Sarah Beth, what is Jump? I haven't heard of that company. What do they do? They do design strategy. So they'll come in and do like design thinking sprints, for example, that kind of work. Interesting, okay. Yeah. Um, another one that's a little bit more in the traditional side, this cruise and excursions director position with a cruise line. But out straight in the first sentence of their job description, they said they're, this is a hybrid role. They're looking for someone that's working on board and ashore. 
So sort of that on and off experience working on the cruise ship and back on land. So using the word hybrid is starting to happen more in the language of job descriptions. Now you don't have to be that explicit, you can be, but just something to think about when you're looking at what this person is doing and what you're hiring for, is it hybrid? Back to the hybrid jobs report by Burning Glass, they talk about why these hybrid jobs matter. The key reason is that they're less vulnerable to automation and outsourcing compared to all jobs. Now, highly hybridized jobs is even a special class within hybrid jobs. And one other note on this too, is that hybrid jobs are growing by 21% over the next decade and get paid 20 to 40% more than other jobs because they're such a rare form of talent and it takes such a unique combination of highly specialized skills that are blending together. This is an example of what highly hybridized work is starting to look like now and into the future. People that are really good at one area of expertise, those deep experts, but are also are using technology and AI and robotics to do their work. So you can't just be a surgeon, you also have to be able to use AI and work with it to be really highly hybridized. Some other examples of highly hybridized jobs are bioinformatician, a financial quantitative analyst, data scientist, cybersecurity analyst, and health information manager. You can start to get the impression here that it's people that are working with really analytical, data-driven information, but also understanding design and presentation and messaging and application of that. So now let's move to the third bucket, which are hybrid workers. We just talked about the work itself, but the workers are people and professionals who combine different work identities together. So they have identity A and B and C equals X, some undefined new identity. They have trouble articulating and defining, here's what I'm good at and here's who I am, because we don't have labels and language to identify that. So the integration of those identities together and working at the intersections is what these types of workers are doing. Here's a great example for you. So Chip Wilson, he's the founder of Lululemon, and he has these three different areas in his background. He really understood retail. He was coming from the sports industry and understood the needs of sports enthusiasts. He also really was knowledgeable about fabric science and different fabric qualities that were available. When you look at the intersection of all three of those, what happens? That's when he saw an opportunity to create a new form of, of apparel that hit a market of people that you know, like to wear um, athletic clothes and be fashionable. And that's where athleisure came from, which we know is a whole new market he developed and it's exploded. And Lululemon has become highly successful, innovative and a market leader. So using your hybrid talent as a professional helps you see things other people don't see and then combine and create new solutions and new products that people really want and that can be huge for your company. Just a note here, because I interview professionals of all backgrounds from finance to physical therapy, to marketing, I've really had a, a range of interviews I've conducted. And some of the trends I notice again and again are what hybrids are good at and what they aren't as good at. One thing hybrids are good at is developing new processes, right? They're looking between sectors and industries and disciplines and they see new ways of developing things. That also makes them good at trend spotting and pattern recognition, um, creating efficiencies, thinking outside the box and breaking the status quo. That tends to be a lot of the language I hear when I talk to them. What they're not as good at is really articulating who they are and what they do. They can sound sort of like an alphabet soup of, I do this and this and this and this and this, and you go, okay, what do you really do? Um, so for them to know what their true value and expertise is, is a problem and that's what they struggle with. And that's why this work of really getting reflective and clear on what your identities are and how they fit together is so important for hybrid professionals. Keeping them engaged in one job, especially for long durations of time is hard. So they might look like job hoppers, but really when they're not being fulfilled for their different talents and they can only use one at a time, that's when they move on from jobs because they don't feel like their full self is showing up or being utilized. 
and just figuring out where they belong in the workforce, right? They're like, I can do so many things. I honestly don't know what my career path is. And that's another frustration for hybrids. So let me give you a few examples of hybrid professionals. Celebrities are, are such a great representation of hybridity because they do so many things. If you look at Michelle Obama and we ask her, what do you do? Her answer is gonna be a mile long. Um, I would love someday to just play a game with people of what job title should Michelle Obama have because she truly defies labels. So celebrities are advocates and actors and philanthropists and executive producers and the list goes on and they truly are hybrids. But then you have people like you and me, everyday workers that are hybrid and we don't realize it or we don't, we don't know how to talk about it because we don't know we can use this language. It's a word that's still slowly becoming mainstream. So take a moment to reflect at this little snapshot of different professionals. These are all headers I've taken from LinkedIn and decide for yourself, which ones do you think are hybrid professionals? Now, this is a little bit of a trick question here because hybridity and being a hybrid professional, you really are one if you believe you are. So we would have to go interview and talk to these professionals to see what they think of themselves. But just from the, the information we have in front of us, I want you to take note of a few things. One is the different grammar and punctuation that people are using <clears throat> to express they have multiple identities. I'm sure you've seen this a lot. Maybe you use it yourself. There's plus signs and commas and slashes and hyphens because it is really hard to show you have a lot of talents and identities. But there's one other interesting thing happening on this slide. There are people that have titles that are not traditional titles. So Jamie, you know, has founder and strategy nerd and digital mad scientist. Hers is unique, but also a little obscure. Like, what does that mean? But then you look at Brittany and Jennifer and Marsha. They aren't listing what they do. They have created a hybrid title for themselves. Brittany's the chief fire starter at Fireside. Jennifer's a people operations extraordinaire. And Marsha is this household chief sanity officer, which I think is kind of hysterical, but it's clever, right? Like these are titles that really stand out because they don't sound as average and ordinary. There's something that piques your curiosity, hopefully makes you wanna say, hey, I wanna to talk to them. What does that mean? I've never heard of that before. And that's the value of using your hybrid title as a way to brand, you know yourself in a way and you're expressing it to really catch people's attention and draw them in. I'll give you a few um, case studies of people that are hybrids. And on this slide is Sarah and Amy. Now, importantly, they don't have hybrid titles. Sarah is a financial advisor. Amy's a director of leadership development. So they're still using traditional titles, which is fine. But look at what they do. Their core professional identities and the bullet points are very divergent types of work they do. So Sarah's a financial planner and yoga instructor, certified life coach and LGBTQ advocate. When she combines all that together, she's inter interconnecting humans with big dreams. That's how she facilitates that and she does that as a financial advisor. With Amy, she calls herself a hostess and marketing strategist, psychological safety expert and entrepreneur. And she uses that to work with leaders and teams on a soul level to create safer and smarter cultures. I've actually witnessed Amy running some of her um, trainings in professional development and it's truly unique. She brings in cocktails to talk about, you know, fight and flight response and she has people drinking and eating and doing things so that they're actually learning about psychology and neuroscience while triggering these fun activities. And that's all a result of her hybridity. A couple others here are Nick and Brittany. So Nick calls himself a plant entrepreneur and Brittany is the chief fire starter. So those are hybrid titles. And you can see below what their core professional identities are. And Nick, because he came from technology and loved plants and was an influencer and advisor, he's now combined that into his own business, becoming a plant coach. And Brittany, she had a background in sports administration and was a director of accounts and then also new marketing. 
And she has launched her own business, really combining those talents and then helping community and neighbors with low cost marketing solutions. So you can see how the diversity of skill sets brings something unique and different that these people want to be known for and are really sharing it in a way that is, is different and also has, has a clear articulation of they know themselves and they know what they're good at and they can tell people about it. So your hybridity can also turn into your hybrid brand and what people are really doing are taking the different parts of themselves and then combining it into new language that's original, creative, and also sparks your interest. You can be funny and clever by combining two words together like hairstylist and therapist to become a hairpist. Or you can be a little more straightforward like a designer strategist catalyst who calls themselves a brand invigorator. There is a sort of fine line here of people that get too far and get a little too crazy and carried away. And then people that are staying a little bit more simple. So you have to experiment with your hybrid title. It's definitely not something that I created overnight for myself and reflecting with people and trying it out with them and even brainstorming with other people is really helpful. And those are some of the tools I use, but it is an iterative process. So I don't want you to think you'll have this in one second um, because you really have to reflect on what are the words that resonate and what synonyms are better. And so you kind of go through a process of elimination. One note here that if you're ever hiring or recruiting or trying to retain hybrid talent for your organization, here's four things I want you to think about. One is use the word hybrid in your job descriptions. I showed you just some examples of that. I think it's great to call it out for what it is. Another is that if you're interviewing a candidate, ask them about their different work identities. I'm sure you've looked at resumes where people have a lot of different jobs in their work history and you don't understand it, but asking them to describe what are your primary identities? What do you really see you're best at? And then how they fit together, that's obviously the trick. If they can describe those relationships between their identities, it will really help you understand why they're the right person for what you're trying to hire them for. Also, hybrids need flexible structures. They don't always do well just being pigeonholed and put in a box. So they might need to co-report, especially if they're working on cross-disciplinary teams, or they might need to belong to different teams and spread their time differently. So just be open to different kinds of structures for them. And the last part, if you're managing a hybrid, check in with them about their hybridity. Ask them, do they feel like they get to use their multiple identities? And if they don't, why not? What's happening? Because if a hybrid is constantly only being used for one of their identities, they're going to burn out. A hybrid needs to be able to show up and use their hybridity. And sometimes they can be a single identity, but they do need to feel like their different identities are being valued. The last note on this piece, and then we'll jump into the activity. This um, article came out in Forbes just a couple weeks ago, and it's by Dan Porterfield, who's the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, which is a giant think tank. And he writes his headline here, hybridity, not rugged individualism is America's competitive advantage. And I think that is such a strong statement because they are doing a lot of research on Americans and what our cultural identity is. And they even arrived at the notion that hybridity, hybridity is a competitive advantage. When you can see that you're combining different things together and explain that, that makes you different. It sets you apart. So that's a really great article and I recommend you check it out. Okay, activity time. So here's where we're gonna explore a little bit of how do you find your, your hybridity? Um, and as I mentioned, this is part of my workbook. So if you check your email confirmation, this is where you should have a couple of attachments. One of them is a professional identity word list and one is an elevator pitch. If you don't have the handouts right now, again, don't worry. Just grab a pen and paper just so you have something to write with and I'll walk you through some steps. So the process when I do it with people or I do it through my online course, it's a five-step journey. We're obviously gonna do it in less than 10 minutes. So this is just a taste test because this is deeply reflective work. There are questions that are going to come up that you've never thought to ask yourself before. So I'm gonna give you the broad brushstrokes today, but traditionally we start with where you are right now, 
What do you currently do? We unpack that to drill down into what that really means, what you're really doing in your work. Then we create these intersections and we look at the different parts and put them back together in a sum. Step four is where I say you hybridize and step five is owning it. You have to believe in your hybridity in order to convey and share it with others. So the first activity goes like this. What are your professional identities? I kid you not, when I sit and have coffee or talk to people and just ask them, what are your professional identities? They don't know how to answer. They just start rambling a list of different things. So you actually need to get really clear. Do you know your different professional identities? This is important too. Usually when people ask you, what do you do? Well, what you do is a verb, right? I do marketing, I do sales, I do, like I help people collaborate, but that's not an identity. So identities and skills sometimes are the same and sometimes they're not. So just because you help people with collaboration, does that mean your identity is a collaborator? In my case, I might say, no, that means that I'm really good at facilitating. I'm a facilitator or I you know, build systems. It's up to you. So you can see identities might be bigger overarching, bigger overarching ideas and what you do falls under that. So here's where I want you to look at the professional identity word list if you have it. If you don't, you can look at the screen and this is just a jumping off point. These are a bunch of identity words. And I want you to go through and circle the ones that resonate with you. Which words really sound like you? Are you a generator? Are you a lecturer? Are you a connector? Are you a commander? There's a lot of fun words here to kind of get you started. And of course, if you don't see a word here that you wanna use, add your own. And if you just have paper next to you, just start writing down words that represent your different professional identities. For some of us, you can use the identities you have today and you use right now, but you also might wanna think about an identity you're trying to become more of. Some people might wanna become more of an empath or they're trying to get more into advising. So you can also use some aspirational identities if you'd like. I'm just gonna give you about 10 seconds to think through this and write some down. Sarah, Beth, the, bottom, the bottom row is cut off on my screen. I don't know if you can scroll down at all. Is that is that the case? It's where, just where a screenshot screen? of the handout. Just yeah, okay. just, just to fit up. the slide. You want to see the bottom row. Sorry, no scrolling on this screen. I wish I could. <laughs> it's a good I question. I want to miss any of them. Yeah, I have two pages of words in the book. And I actually, I'm going to add an addendum because I have so many new words that people have shared with me when I've gone through this process with them. And let me know if there's any questions yet. This is a great time to interrupt for any questions. Sarah Beth, this is Amy Schwartz. And I wondered, is there a goal of numbers we should look at? That's a great question, Amy. So for right now, I say circle as many as you like, as many that seem to fit you and resonate. But in a moment, we are going to do that um, trimming down process where we reduce this into a core set. So it's sort of the go big, to then trim it down idea right now. Thank you. Okay, as you're finishing choosing as many as you'd like, I'm gonna talk about the next part of this. So Amy teed this up perfectly for me. Thank you, Amy. There are two types of identities I want you to think about as you're looking at this list. One are your primary professional identities. Those are your core. And the others are your non-primary. Sometimes I call those secondary and tertiary. So here's the key difference between the two. Primary identities are the ones you use daily, almost daily even. They light you up and bring you a lot of energy and joy because these are your truest areas of expertise. You just love using these identities. And you need to have at least 
two uh, identities to be a hybrid, right? One and one together creates an intersection. But eventually you're gonna narrow this down to no more than four. I know it's hard to reduce these, but that two, three, or four are the, the limit of the number of professional identities you can have. And I'll explain in a moment why. Now, the other identities that are on your list, they are part of you too. It's just that you don't use them as frequently. You probably use them once in a while or as needed. They're also identities you love, but again, are you using them regularly? And if you couldn't use those identities for a while, would you be okay with that? Whereas your primary identities, if someone told me, Sarah Beth, you can never make art again, I would go, you've gotta be crazy. That's a really important identity to me. I need my artistic identity. So that's how vital your primary identities are to you. They really are your, your core drivers and your truest expertise. So as you're looking at your list, if you had 20 or 10 or however many, I want you to narrow it down and put little stars or dots or whatever you need to find the two, three or four that truly are your primary ones. And we're doing this quickly today. So come back to this later and think about it more. Um, this is a process of elimination. So in a moment, we're gonna make a Venn diagram but here's what happens when you have two, three, or four primary identities. You'll notice that there's more intersections. So you only have one intersection with two, you have four if there's three, and you actually have nine if you have four primary identities. So the more identities, the more complexity because there's more intersectionality. And based on identity research, we can only show up in a moment and be three or four identities at once. Like we can't juggle 10 identities simultaneously when we're doing something. So there's also a practical part of this. So just think about that as we move forward. This is the key question that people haven't thought of before, but really is revolutionary and breakthrough to helping you figure out who you are. The question is this, who are you in the intersections of your primary professional identities? Now that question is probably really foreign to you and you don't know how to answer it and that's okay. I'll give you some tips. So you're gonna take your Venn diagram and put your primary professional identities in each circle. And then I want you to start thinking instead of who are you in those intersections, go back a step and ask yourself, what are you doing? when these professional identities, <clears throat> excuse me, are combining. And to help you even more, it's about your feelings. So I want you to reflect on moments in your work when you feel your best. You're like, oh my gosh, I ran the best meeting yesterday. Or wow, this client relationship is going so great because of X, Y, and Z. Or I'm really proud of this new marketing campaign we just created because of blank. When you feel your best in your work, that's a moment I want you to pause and look at what are you actually doing in that moment? How did you create that marketing campaign? What identities were showing up? Because your hybridity is showing up in these moments when you feel your best. So it's a process of working backwards to get to those identities. So this is a crazy slide, but essentially what I'm trying to illustrate here is that when you look at your different identities in your Venn diagram, you're gonna kind of eliminate those traditional labels and not think of yourself, in my case, as an artist or educator or researcher. Instead, I'm trying to get curious about who am I as an artist and an educator or the artist educator researcher. Those are new identities that you don't have terms or language for yet. So that's why they're question marks. And that's what you get to dig into and explore. I do this by creating lists. And I think of it like a math equation. And I start to reflect as I was telling you about these memories when I feel my best and what was I doing? And then I sort of ask myself, well, what identities were showing up? So an example from my work is I created this really interesting infographic. It was um, a, a design of mountains. And on top of the mountains, I was categorizing different parts of an ecosystem. I was looking at competitions and prototyping spaces and funding, and those all became this beautiful visual. Well, that's a tool that no one had created before. And what was happening is I was using my researcher identity, designer identity, and artist identity at the same time 
when I created this really beautiful infographic of an ecosystem. So that's how I started to explore. What you're also noticing as you make these lists, our key words are going to start um, showing up again and again. For me, a key word was, you know, being artistic and creative, challenging things, disrupting things. And as a result, that's where I started to see the synergy of patterns across these different intersections. When you see the patterns and themes, that will inspire you on what your hybridity is. So in my case, I told you I used to call myself a director of programs. Then I got clear on my primary professional identities, artist, researcher, educator, designer. And when I looked in the intersections and found themes and patterns, I noticed this disruption and creativity was important to me. And that's how I eventually landed on the title of creative disruptor. So I'm simplifying the process. There is a lot more to it. And it does take time to sort of get used to thinking about yourself as an intersectional person. But this is really powerful. And it feels like I arrived at my truest professional self. I feel so good about talking about being a creative disruptor and using that to help people understand me that I, it's just become a radical new way to express my professional value. So the last activity we're gonna do um, is how do you introduce yourself as a hybrid? Because I get that question so often. And I created this elevator pitch and it's kind of like a Mad Lib to make this super simple for you. It's really three parts. So the first part is giving your name and calling out that you are a hybrid. And if you have your hybrid title, you insert it then. In. Then you explain what the parts of your hybridity are because your audience is gonna ask you, well, if you're hybrid, what does that mean? So you kind of jump ahead and anticipate that. And then the last part is the relationships. How do the, those identities fit together? So it might sound something like this. Hi, my name is Sarah Beth Burke and I'm a hybrid professional. I call myself a creative disruptor. That means I combine my professional identities of being an artist, researcher, educator, and designer to radically create innovation strategies that support people and processes in new ways. Boom, that's my 10 second introduction. I gave you a high level. I teased out the idea of my hybridity. I gave you a little definition of it. And then when I've used this, the result I've seen again and again is that people have more questions. They get more interested in me. It's a new idea and they're like, wow, I wanna understand you, this is so exciting and interesting. I haven't heard of this before. And that's really the goal is to allow better conversation, deeper conversation, and just more synergy between you and your audience. I've adapted this during email intros and cover letters and networking. It really has become a strategy that I've seen be very valuable. So to wrap things up, as I mentioned, I research and study hybrid identity, and obviously that's what I'm sharing with you today, but I'm also this hybrid professional myself, and I work in organizations where I've applied my hybridity in hybrid roles. And so what I've been doing is creating these innovation strategies, um, as I mentioned, to connect people and resources and ideas. And I've done that in Denver Public Schools, to CU Boulder, with ed tech startups, foundations and nonprofits because these large community impact projects really are about you know, tying cross-disciplinary stakeholders and ideas together, and that's where my synergy is. So some of the ways I help organizations solve their problems is helping them lead these new innovation strategies and implement them, because obviously you can say, like C. Boulder wanted to be the innovation university, but they didn't know how to make that happen and to change the perception um, that their different audiences, faculty and staff and the community had about them. And so I help you know, create these new, people call me sometimes an ecosystem builder, which is how do we help people from siloed areas of expertise like the research community or early childhood or funders and entrepreneurs all start to work together to share and create better solutions. And I act as the glue helping map out and create strategies that connect them. Um, I mentioned my story about the infographic and the mountain range, and you can see an image here of it. That's really a landscape analysis and it combined empathy research. 
And so I'm really good at studying what's happening here. What are the different pain points and why are people connecting or not connecting and how do we get them to collaborate and use the resources that are available? And then of course, how do we measure that impact and social impact is a challenging thing to see. So my research background and artistic background have made me really um, able to start to understand ways to ask questions and bring that back together into data. Um, recently, just as a quick example, I was working with a woman who created a new literacy tool. She has a startup and she kept going to schools to you know, get her product to the market. And I talked to her about her other strategies of reaching parents. And so again, I really help funders and founders and entrepreneurs and program leaders see what, what's happening in their programs and how we can do something more innovatively to get the result they want. And my design thinking background is something I've used a lot in facilitating that. And then Futurebound, um, one of the projects I supported with Gary Community Investments was a whole new brand of supporting early childhood impact across Colorado. And I helped activate that and create stories and talk about ventures that were really moving the dial. So that's a little bit about how my hybridity has been used in these really complex kind of network and multidisciplinary projects to make sense of what we need to do and then make that a really successful project moving forward. And I'm happy to share more later, um, but I'll pause with that. And so that is really the overview of what hybrid professionals are and what's happening in the hybrid workforce and workplace. And Griffin and I are gonna move into a Q&A. And as she mentioned, and we can share more about this in the Q&A, Griffin and I did a little hybrid identity work session and discovered that she is really the director of discovery. That is part of her hybridity, in addition to being the founder and CEO of Canopy. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we can talk about this. Thank you, Sarah Beth. Can we just all do a little round of applause? That was so insightful. That was phenomenal. Um, I loved it. And I feel like just hearing you speak has finally like uncovered within me why I've always cringed when people ask me. I'm one of the people that answered. I definitely cringe when people say, what do you do? Yeah. And I sort of have to take a deep breath and be like, okay, well, where is this person coming from? What's their background? What's the angle of this conversation? Because it's not a one word answer. And coming from a law firm background, there was certainly a strong emphasis on specializing and you've got to find your niche. And that always kind of gave me pause because I think I am a true hybrid where I felt like, but I want to integrate all these things. And your, you know, your example of the gooey pizza was like, <laughs> I want to be the gooey pizza. I don't want to be the individual dry ingredient that doesn't speak to me. Yeah. So I love how you led me through that hybrid workshop last week. And, um, what I learned is that I love to be involved in discovery, discovery both of new talent, discovery of new opportunities. And not only do I have a hybrid identity myself, but you know, curiously enough, I founded a company that is really a hybrid company as well. And as I mentioned early on, you know, Canopy is really part talent curation, finding somebody incredible like you to share with our community, part business marketplace, uh, where we really match incredible talent with opportunities, and then part solution matchmaker. So thank you for helping me wrap my arms around something that has kind of eluded me for a long time. I, I still pause, like, how do I describe Canopy? What, what is the one sentence intro that makes sense to people? Um, so I, I have a question to start with to kind of get this rolling, but I noticed two people during our first poll answered that their organizations really have this hybrid thing figured out. So if those people are willing and open to share about that, either one of those, I'd love to learn more about where you work and how you've integrated this into your workforce. Um, and also want to open it up just to any other questions for Sarah Beth. Yeah, I would love to know those organizations too. Right? <laughs> Who okay. figured this That's out? Amazing. Right, right. And yes, Renee asked if there will be copies of your slides. We will follow up with a recording uh, for all those that attended this morning. So if you want to go back, watch anything again, we'll also attach um, the handouts again that Sarah Beth walked us through together. So we will be following up with that. So thanks Renee for asking. Yeah, and if people want to unmute themselves and ask a question or put in the chat, I think we're open to either. 
And I just wanted to um, reflect on what Griffin said a moment ago about, you know, Canopy is a hybrid organization. And that was one of the biggest points that we had to work through when I was talking with Griffin, because we started with Griffin's identity since her background's so multifaceted. And it's like, okay, Griffin, what do you really do now? And then we're like, but she founded this organization that's hybrid too. So we had a double hybrid layer. And it was so great to really say, what are the parts of Canopy? And I pushed her to really break it down into the actions and the services that are true and are the core. And then I think once we got more certainty on that, it was sort of the aha happened. And then you quickly were like, well, I do a lot of discovery and it just snowballed. It was great. Exactly. I think we both at the same moment were like, that's it. Yeah, I love it. That, that speaks to me. I finally get it. So we plan to have the rest of our team at Canopy go through the same exercise as well, um, because I think it unleashes in everybody what they love to do. And then what a gift to the community that they're working with to be able to work in a space that they feel so connected with. Yeah. And another thing people tell me a lot is, Sarah Beth, I've done, you know, a Myers-Briggs and I know my disc and I've done strengths finders. And those are really great tools that are personality assessments and work style assessments. But again, it's still not your identity. So just because you know your strengths and your INTFJ profile, who are you? What does that make you? And that's a very different question. And I don't know if we've ever challenged ourselves enough to, to name ourselves. The power of the hybrid work, I think, is that you own your professional identity. Yes, you've been given a job title and you probably have a formal role, but who are you outside of that formal job title? Figure that out. Right, um, and thank you, Miriam, for yeah. jumping in with a question. We'd love to hear it. So from, I'm, I'm business development and sales. And my question is, and it was something I had asked you, you know, privately, but this is actually a good time for me to ask because it's my, um, it's my function to uncover need, uncover, um, you know, issues that need to be addressed with potential clients. So when I look at the word hybrid and having, uh, and, and this is based on my experiences, recent experiences of job hunting myself, but then also in the past and in, in other business development positions. My concern is that when I am calling on clients and they're, you know, and if I use the, the word hybrid, they're, and they're, maybe they're using, I want someone who can wear a lot of hats. Generally speaking, it's been my experience that when they talk about a lot of hat wearing or hybrids, it means you're going to wear a lot of hats, but we're only paying for one. And so I need to, it would be helpful for me to know how to, um, how to have a conversation with a prospect so that they understand that you're not just getting a, you know, a, a, a peg to go in that slot. This yeah. is about someone who's going to bring a whole lot more to the table. Totally. Yeah, that's a great point. A uh, couple quick reflections on that. One is that when you're really good at, I'll, I'll say, pitching yourself as a hybrid, your hybridity is your truest area of expertise. So you are articulating by bundling these different talents you have, you are an expert of something nobody else is. And that's why you're, you should be hired. That's what sets you apart from the competition. And that's what you're bringing to the table. So when I talk to consultants, I'll just use this as a generic um, answer. You know, a lot of consultants are uh, strategists or they're coaches. They, they use a lot of the same language. And when you look at that landscape, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what makes different consultants good at what they do. Like I couldn't tell them apart. So I would say you've got to specify the type of strategy you're doing or the type of, you know, leadership development you're doing. And that extra layer of specificity, that hybridity then becomes your brand. And then your value, I think, does start to rise higher because they realize they're not just getting another coach development person blank. They're getting this special blank. Sorry, my dog is getting excited. I hope that helps you a little bit, Miriam. It, it does. Um, it's, it's, it was less about me and more about having those conversations about 
yeah. um, about the the canopy bench of talent. Totally. And in in having those conversations with potential, you know, with people who would hire them. Absolutely. Thank I've you. Been, yeah, specificity is a really powerful part of this um, because everybody starts to sound the same. So, what is the thing that makes you sound different? How do you express your uniqueness? That's what I would say. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Miriam. And we have one more question. We are at 10 o'clock, so I want to honor everyone's time and say thank you. We'll get to that question if you have time to stay. But thanks to Sarah Beth. If any of you would like to connect with Sarah Beth for your organizations with any of the amazing work that she does, please let us know. We would love to facilitate that. And with that, our final question is from Kate Kalstein, who's one of our nonprofit consultants. She mentioned a lot of consultants in our group work with high level leaders around strategy. Um, but she said, how do you see the opportunity in hybrid roles being different from reactive hybrids? So Kate, I don't know if you can speak a little bit more to- Yeah, what I, would, what I would say there is so often within organizations, you see the job descriptions and the organizational chart become reactive to the individuals that find themselves in the role uh, and the hybridity yeah. that they bring, as opposed to the proactive and the real intentional strategic designing of those roles for what best serves the organization or their mission. And I wonder about how you make sure to include that as a part of the conversation, both focusing yourself individually, but also as we work with our clients. That's a terrific point, the reactive proactive. And I think you're right, just because you have to lay people off or consolidate roles and someone's like, hey, can you jump into this, this and this? It's part of your responsibilities and we'll deal with it later. That is not the best use of creating hybrid roles or hybrid talent. So, um, I would, I would say that's not truly a hybrid role, right? It's just multiplicity being lumped together saying, this is just something we need to deal with in the moment. But the thoughtfulness and truly developing and saying, we need an expert who can do these two different things really well is truly the future. And that's what really hiring hybrid talent and creating hybrid jobs is about. So thanks for that distinction because I think it's a really important one. Thanks, yeah. Kate. And then Sarah Beth, we have one more question okay. from Ed, another Canopy consultant. I love this, Ed. He calls himself an advisorpreneur. So I don't oh, know yeah. if he came up with that today. Maybe you can tell us or if you've called yourself that before. But he would like to know when you started your research and how COVID has impacted the acceptance of the hybrid title. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I started this research almost a decade ago because that's when I was having my professional identity crisis. Um, so it wasn't formal yet. I really started to do it as a series in Denver about five, six years ago. And the book just came out last year because it took me that much time to marinate on this and also validate, validate, am I talking about something that people care about and also feel? And it turns out, yes, like there is a lot of interest in this. And then what was part two, something about COVID? How has COVID impacted the acceptance of the hybrid title? Um, COVID's accelerated it like everything today. The word hybrid, I've been setting Google alerts for years on anything with hybridity. And it talked a lot about like hybrid cars and hybrid scientific discoveries and um, things in engineering. But once COVID hit, hybrid work, hybrid learning, hybrid events, hybrid everything literally became a whole new trending word in Google searches. So I've seen more acceptance because people are more aware of this word hybrid but the application to people still is a gap. So when I bring that forward of, we need to talk about ourselves as hybrid professionals, people go, oh my gosh, of course, why aren't we talking about that? So it's really helped um, people believe in this and see the importance so much more. This is helpful to know I'm not schizophrenic. <laughs> no, you're great. <laughs> I love that. I think prior, prior terms that really got popularized were multi-potentialite, um, a slash, there's a couple others. And oh, the T-shaped person is really popular. And the way I say it is, I don't wanna introduce myself as a T-shape or pie-shaped person or a multi-potentialite. That language is really thick and heavy and awkward. So I'm a hybrid, it makes more sense. Multi-potentialate, is that what it was? Yes. <laughs> it's a I whole don't community. That That's <laughs> terrible, just terrible. All right, any <laughs> other final questions before we sign off? If not, thank you, Sarah Beth. That yeah, was thank excellent. you, everyone. I loved it. What a great way to start the day. And thank you all for joining us.
We'll be in touch about details on our next upcoming webinar. Look for that invite in your inbox. And until then, have a great day. We hope to be in touch. Thank you. Thank you I so appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Well, thank you. I looks like yeah. we had two that are still <laughs> hanging on here, but that was incredible. I loved it. it oh my so gosh. Yeah. It just flew by. It felt really good today and great questions from people. They were very engaged. Yeah. Oh no, it flew by. And I, but I think the timing was perfect because everyone got a chance to do a hands-on mm -hmm. activity, but also learn something and also apply it and ask questions and they're on their way in an hour. So totally. Thank you. That yeah, was no we'll share the feedback with you. Um, we'll send the recording out uh, with all the handouts again, hopefully today or tomorrow. And, you know, it's interesting. I noticed a lot of, uh, there were some attendees like um, Ed Nichols. I don't know if you're familiar with the Joshua mm -hmm. School. Ed used to be, he's definitely a hybrid, I would say. He's okay. like a parent's generation, but he was an ex-IBM like executive turned a nonprofit ED. And so I think he loves this and I could see him, mm. you know, finding a way to fold you into their work. So oh, interesting. I'm going to follow up. Yeah. I'm definitely going to kind of take note of who is here and who we can reach out to specifically to say, Hey, wasn't that amazing? Do you want to do a one-on-one -on -one with Sarah Beth? Just, you know, like a brainstorm Thanks. of how she can yeah. help Joshua school. So we'll think through a couple of those and That'd be wonderful. Uh, this will lead to some great work. So thank you. Oh, Griffin, this was terrific. And your team has been so great helping me. So thanks for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Thanks so much for doing it. We loved it. Okay. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye.